An eighth common Christian teaching is doctrine or teaching about the Christian church. Here, though, we really do need to make a distinction between formal teaching and practical Methodist outworking of that teaching. And it uh, really does amount to a kind of a tension in Methodist life. The formal teaching, which is encoded in the article of religion, states that the church is a body of believers where the word of God is preached and the sacraments are duly administered. So I would say in that definition to have church, you've, you've got to have three things. You've got to have a coming together of believers, body of believers, where, number two, the word of God is preached. That is to say, the gospel about Jesus Christ is consistently preached. And where, third, the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper are consistently administered to the congregation. Now that's a kind of formal definition of church. It comes from the Anglican article of religion, and it's almost uh, exactly the same as what appears in the Lutheran Augsburg Confession. So we could say that's a very standard uh, part of Christian teaching. On the other hand, Methodists have always emphasized the nature of the Christian community as an evangelistic community. That is to say, its principal task, its principal mission, is evangelization. And John Wesley often spoke of the Methodist societies in this way, uh, not entirely about evangelism. I mean, I think his principal concern was that the Methodist societies existed for the cultivation of Christian holiness, but evangelism was part of that work leading people to greater and greater sanctification, to greater and greater Christian holiness. And so that's an important part of how he understood the mission of the Methodist people. Methodists have always had both of those things, and I sometimes say it's exemplified in Methodist church architectures. We've got a lot of architectures that are very simple and really evangelistically oriented. The old Methodist buildings that were built in the 18th century were octagonal, eight-sided chapels, and they were octagonal probably because uh, you could hear better in that space. It was a very functional space for preaching, uh, not originally designed for the celebration of the sacraments. Early Methodist buildings in the United States tended to be like barns, uh, very crude structures that had two doors at the back, one for men and one for women. They sat separately in their bands, in their prayer bands, uh, with men on one side and women on the other side, kind of like in a very traditional Jewish synagogue, or I've discovered an Oriental Orthodox worship, like the worship of the Coptic uh, Orthodox churches, where men and women sit on different sides. Uh, but those buildings were not very uh, impressive. Uh, later on, you get Methodist building, Gothic church buildings from the 1860s and 70s. Uh, and yet, at the same time, they're building some auditoriums that just look like um, auditoriums for the performance of popular music. And then you get a unique Methodist hybrid, what was called the Akron Plan. And the Akron Plan Church had uh, kind of a look outside it of a Gothic sanctuary. Uh, and then, uh, on the other hand, it had some kind of programmable space where you could shut little um, wooden uh, dividers and open up, uh, shut up space for Sunday schools and then open it up as extra worship space. And so it was kind of a combination of sacred space, sacramental space on the one hand, and functional evangelistic space on the other hand. I use that as an, exa as an example of the tension in Methodist life between this more formal and sacramental understanding of the nature of the church and this more functional, mission-oriented statement. So in the United Methodist Church, we say that the mission of the church is to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. That doesn't nullify our article of religion, but it really puts the emphasis on that mission-oriented stress and emphasis. A ninth common teaching is really about a common Christian practice, that is the practice of baptism. Almost every Christian group, with very few exceptions, practice baptism 
by water as the means by which we are incorp we, we incorporate people into the Christian community. Uh, we may disagree about how much water and at which age you apply the water, but almost every Christian community, with the exception of Salvation Army and Quakers, utilize water following the commandment of Jesus himself, um, go into the world baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit as the means by which we incorporate people into the community of church. As I said earlier, John Wesley believed that baptism conveys an actual grace. Uh, he believed that when infants were baptized, including himself, they were given the gifts at that point of justification and regeneration, even though he thought they would likely send those away because of bad influences on them along the way, and they would stand in need of a new revivification, a kind of revival of the faith that they had received in baptism. Uh, and he taught people, you cannot lean on that slender reed of baptism uh, as an assurance that you are forgiven of your sins and so forth. You have to believe on your own. Now, a couple of things about John Wesley's views. He accepted the Church of England's view of uh, baptism of infants, uh, long practiced in northern European churches, uh, and uh, actually long practiced in Christian communities, probably from the 100s or 200s AD, uh, and left in the Articles of Religion the statement that the baptism of young children is to be retained in the church. Um, he allowed for different modes of baptism. As a matter of fact, one of his own revisions of the Book of Common Prayer is that the Common Prayer book, interestingly, stated that infants were to be immersed. And uh, John Wesley actually practiced that one time in Georgia, got a lot of complaints that he might kill infants by immersing them in frigid water in the winter. But uh, when he altered that uh, liturgy, that rubric, he stated that uh, the baptism could occur by sprinkling, pouring, or uh, immersion. Methodists have historically allowed uh, those means. Now I would say, just looking forward to some future things, um, ecumenical engagement has caused our church and other churches to nuance those points of view uh, so that we have come to emphasize the importance of adult baptism as part of the overall process of Christian initiation. Uh, it used to be that we always put the ritual for infant baptism first in our hymnals, then the uh, ritual for adult baptism second, as if it was a kind of exception to the general rule. Uh, and as of the 1989 United Methodist Hymnals, we've reversed that order so that now the order for baptism with full profession of faith is the first, and in a sense it looks like the kind of normative pattern, and then the baptism of infants and others who cannot answer for themselves is in a kind of secondary position. I think that's an important symbolic change for Methodists. And you may have noticed that many Methodist churches are now building immersion baptistries. We said we were going to give people the option of being immersed, but we didn't practically do that because we didn't have immersion baptistries. Uh, lots of churches, not just Methodists, but Presbyterian and Lutheran and Catholics and others are building immersion baptistries now. And the church I attend here in Dallas, Lover's Lane United Methodist Church, has an outdoor immersion baptistry, has a hot water tap so we can keep the water at a reasonable temperature in all seasons of the year. Uh, but uh, we do most of the baptisms at Lover's Lane United Methodist Church, at least adult baptisms, uh, by immersion now. So there are some, some uh, beginnings of changes on those historic views. Uh, I would say one word to candidates here for ordained ministry in the United Methodist Church. If you're asked questions about baptism uh, by your district committee on ordained ministry or your annual conference board of ordained ministry, I have two words of advice for you. Number one, what they may be looking for, despite whatever their questions are, is whether you're willing to baptize infants. If you came from a Baptist or Pentecostal background, very often that sets off a kind of flag for folks in these 
uh, Board of Ordained Ministry groups, and they want to know if you're seriously Methodist enough that if somebody presents their infant to you for baptism, you will do that. Second thing I think they're going to want to know is whether you believe that God is acting in baptism. There was a long period of our history in the middle 20th century when Methodists liked to say, well, this is just a kind of neat symbol of things that, uh, that we do. It's a symbol of our commitment to raise the child in the Christian faith, or it's a symbol of the commitment of adult and so forth. What we desperately wanted to avoid saying was that God is doing anything in baptism. And I would say... It's a very reasonable uh, expectation that the Board of Ordained Ministry may want to hear from you, not just that we do this and we do that and so forth in baptism. We allow this and we allow immersion and pouring and sprinkling and so forth. They may want to hear you say something about God's activity in baptism.